Hi there and a very warm welcome to tutorial number 50. To celebrate this 50th tutorial, I'll be also releasing a studio or office tour later this day. This week's topic is set depth, as I overheard quite a lot of conversations where people had problems dialing in the right values into the set depth into Octane. Also, there's going to be a bonus to that, so stick around until the end of the video to know more. Thanks a lot to all my Patreons for supporting me. Also, if you like my content and want to support me, maybe you want to become a Patreon. The link is down in the description below. And now, finally, without further ado, let's get started with the tutorial. Again, I've been stealing the scene from my Light ID tutorial. Hit the info box in the upper right corner if you want to know more. The scene is slowly becoming my favorite scene to show off stuff, so let's get going with set depth. Of course, set depth is an AOV, so multipass in old language. Let's bring it into our AOVs by going to the render settings, Octane Renderer. Since I'm singing the gospel for true linear workflow, let's just engage that here by going to color space, linear sRGB. If you want to know more about linear workflows, you can watch any of my compositing tutorials. Now let's move further to the render AOV outputs, enable them, make sure they're set to XR, 16-bit is OK, and the compression method is DWAB. Usually the notion people have with EXRs is that they are huge, but let me assure you, DWAB is very small, often smaller than an 8-bit PNG while at the same time storing vastly more data. Next, again the usual, I don't want to save my multi-layer files and I want to save my beauty. The multi-layer file is personal preference, so you can do so if you like. Next, we are finally there, let's open the AOV manager, scroll down here and find the set depth or C depth. Here we go. And we can see now we have a C depth pass here. In order to not have too many windows open, let's close this and instead go to the render AOVs and open that up and then go to the C depth and dwell that also down. Here we go. Now let's see what this looks like. Here we go. And this is what a set depth should look like. So basically objects right in front of the camera would be black and then the further they move away, the lighter they become. Now in this room, at some point, after that we can't see anymore, because everything vanishes into white. And we have a certain point when this happens, so let's figure out when this happens by going to the camera, going to the focal distance, and roughly measure that point. It's roughly that lag here, so let's measure that, and it's around 504 centimeters. Now, if you watched closely, what the values here say is that the set depth max is at 5. And if you know octane, this is octane units. And octane units are in meters. So 5 means 5 meters. So those values more or less correlate. To set up this correctly, you would measure the furthest away point from the camera to get this value then into the set depth max. So let's do this by going to the picker here and pick a point against the back wall here. And this gives us around 5 meter and 50. So let's go with a set depth max of 5,5. And when we did everything right, a lot of the geometry now is visible that was swallowed by the formerly over bright pixels. So if you render this out, you would get a very nice gradient from a darker color near the camera to a white color where you see an ends. But let me show you something that is very interesting and this only works when you're working with floating point workflows, meaning EXR 32-bit for example. If I now go to my set depth max and set it to 1, of course the white begins at 1 meter and we don't see anything at all because there's no objects closer than one meter in front of the camera. But let me hit render real quick and we can see what we get in our compositing program. Welcome to Fusionland. This could be done in After Effects, Photoshop or any other application that understands 32-bit floating point values. So let's bring in our set depth from our Connell box and display it. And of course, we see the same thing as before. 
But when we add a color correct, here we go, and make this visible and go to the gain and actually lower that, you can see that formerly overexposed parts of the image become visible again. What's really interesting here is that if we display our main input here and then sample parts of our scene with a mouse, you can get some brightness values down on the bottom here. And since we set our set depth value to one, meaning it is measuring one meter, those values are representing meters in distance from the camera. So if we find something that is closer, like the wall on the side, you can see it's three meters. And if we go to the edge here, we can see it's about five meters 40, what we also measured with our camera. Now, we cannot see this, but the data is there, and this is the really interesting thing. Now, going back to our color corrector, we can even make it look the same like in the scene we had before, where we had set the depth to 5 meter 50. So, to do this, we go to the gain, set it to 1, and then divide it by 5.5. And here we go, we have the same exact result in our comp program derived from an image that was invisible before. Remember, this is only possible because we set our set depth max to 1, which equals 1 meter. Otherwise, we would have to deal with other values. Welcome to our second simplified 3D scene to dive deep into the myths of the set depth channel. This scene is set up exactly the same like the other one we just did but I haven't tweaked the values yet. So let's go to the set depth here and let's see what's happening. Now, this scene is in millimeters. So if we go to our scene settings and look at the scale, it says millimeter. And this is because the gradient goes much further. So if we set it to centimeters and re-render, you can see now the gradient is vanishing rather quickly. So again, those octane values here are always displayed in meters. What we haven't talked about yet is the environment depth. And this is a very important point here. Also, I noticed when you first engage the set depth, you get a white background. And this shouldn't be as the environment depth is very low. So if I do anything to the set depth values here and re-render, now we get something like this. And this is basically how your scene should look from the start with those values. And this is also a thing probably a lot of you get confused with. So hopefully this gets fixed soon. But back to topic, the environment depth sets the depth value for the background. So if the distance to the camera is set to almost zero, the background is set to a black color. And the more we are nearing the max value here, the more the background becomes white. So let's go with the half of it, 2.5. And you can see now the background is a middle gray because we are telling the set depth gradient to go up to five meters from black to white. And now our environment is set to a distance of 2.5 meters. I know it makes no sense to have the environment closer than the furthest away object, but this is how it's set up. So basically what you're doing, if you want to have an ongoing gradient from objects closest to the camera appearing black and objects on the horizon appearing white, you have to go to the environment and set it to the same number as the set depth max. So let's render out this one real quick and have a look in comp. Let's bring our set depth pass into the comp and display it. And we can see it looks the same as in 3D. Again, let's make a color correction. Here we go. And let's go to the gain and lower it. But first we want to display the color correction. And as we lower it, something strange happens. There are cubes brighter than the environment. How is that possible? So basically we set our maximum white level to five meters. So after five meters, everything is saturated in white. Then we set our background to have exactly that white color. Now, if we go down with our exposure, the background exposure also goes down and it reveals all the cubes that come after that. Remember that room before where we could expose stuff that was formerly swallowed in white color? This here is exactly the same. 
So again, the most healthy thing to do would be to measure the distance to the most far apart object and then set this value into your set depth as well as into your environment depth. So let's see how this is working. In our scene, again, the best way to measure it that I found is the camera. So let's go into the camera and go for the focus distance and measure the furthest apart object here. This gives us roughly about 7,000 centimeters, which equals 70 meters. So let's go into our set depth channel here and go and set this to 70, as well as the environment depth to 70. Here we go. And now you basically have a nice gradient that spans all of your scene without producing any weird artifacts later in comp when you have those overbright values. So let's render this out for a last time and jump over to comp. Over in comp for a last time, let's import our set depth here and let's display it. And we can see it's basically again the same what we got in our 3D program. So let's for a last time go with the color correction and then go and set the gain lower. And you can see now the furthest away objects and the background are actually now synchronized so you don't have any brighter than white values in there. Back in the 3D scene and I hear you saying, well that's all fine and good, but it's really tedious, isn't there a different way to do this? For example, what if I want to invert my gradient and want to go from white to black in the distance? And I'm happy to say there are ways to do that, but not with the set depth though, not directly anyway. So let's add another render AOV and let me introduce you to the global texture. Global texture is, as the name implied, a texture that is applied globally to all of your scene objects and then rendered out in a different path. Again, to save on some space, let's close this window and let's dwell down the global texture here. And we can see we have an input for a texture and an alpha. Since we don't need an alpha, let's go and find the octane texture for set depth. And yes, there's actually a texture, so if we go to the Octane shaders, we search for Custom Texture, and there it is. So if we select the Custom Texture, we need to go to Basic, and then go down here in the dropdown and select Set Depth. Here we go. Then we can go back to Shader to set our settings here. Now let's hit Render and see how this looks. Make sure Normalize Result is turned on, otherwise those sliders won't work and our workaround won't work either. Also, the naming is a little bit misleading, so X should be close and Y should be far. So normalize range close, normalize range far. So if we now type in 75 into the far range, now we basically have the same result, but we are missing the environment depth. And this indeed would be very dramatic, but there's actually a small trick to it. We can inverse the result. So instead of the far range, we are setting that to zero. We are getting the close range to 75. And now we are having a gradient from the far range, which is black, towards the camera, which is white. To demonstrate that better, we can go ahead and, for example, type in 20. And now you can see we have the last 20 meters from black to white. Last but not least, you might say, wait, everything is great, but we need our set depth pass without anti-aliasing. We need it aliased. I don't know if a lot of people know this exists, but it does in Octane. So under parameters here and under info sampling mode, you can go to distributed rays and set them to non-distributed without pixel filtering. And if we now re-render, you can see that basically we have no anti-aliasing on our objects. So if you're using plugins to do depth of field, this is important for them to work correctly. And this is pretty much it. If you're still around, thank you very much for staying with me all the time. Hopefully you like what you saw and find it useful. If you do so, please consider supporting me on Patreon. Thank you very much for my existing patrons who supported me to make videos such as this possible. Keep your eyes open for the studio slash office tour that will appear on this channel later today. 
And with that said, I'm wishing you the best of times. Until later this day, maybe, or next week, happy set depth diving. Bye.